Hi, this is Todd Martin with The Walking Code, and I am here for my first YouTube live stream. I'm going to give it a couple minutes because we are going live technically at 9 o'clock a.m. San Diego time. So thank you for joining me if you're already on here. And we're just going to give a few minutes for people to come in. And the purpose of this live stream is to try to do question and answer for any of you out there. If you're on live, then put your comments in the chat if you have any questions about walking technique. And if you're watching this after the fact, which many of you may be, then put comments in there also, and then I can respond to your comments afterwards. But it would be really great if people were coming on live so we can get some real-time chat and feedback going on regarding walking technique. And I'm going to have my lovely assistant, who is my wife, give me a, a little cue when it becomes 9 o'clock. Um, I don't see you on the screen. Oh, you don't see me on the screen? It's saying that I'm alive in 20 minutes. Hmm? Um, so we're going to go through some technical challenges here. My wife is on watching and says she doesn't see me. So no, let's see what's going on. Was, what's it showing? It's showing live in 28 minutes. So it gave me a countdown. Right now it's saying I am live. And if you're on with me, I'm talking to my wife who's sitting across from me and trying to watch this and says that I am not live for her. So if I'm live for you, mm -hmm. excuse me for talking strange. Okay, so you're trying to figure uh, this out. Our other guest that's on says they can see you. Oh, you can, okay, great. So, great. So, go ahead. I'll try to deal with my issues on this end, and you go right in. Okay, so. Oh, I see you now on, I see you on a different device, so you go ahead. Okay, excellent. All right, so what I'm going to do first is just give a little bit of a discussion of what I'm doing on my channel, and then, of course, if you have a comment or a question, just go ahead and put it in, and my wife is going to let me know if there's any questions for people. So you've got a hello from James Smith. Hey, James. Good to see you on or hear you because I can't see you. Uh, thank you so much for joining me on the live stream. And thanks for all the support you've been giving to the channel uh, so far. You're my first member and hanging in there. So uh, I love all the comments that you give all the time and the feedback. Uh, really awesome support from you, James. Thanks. Hope to visit you sometime in Britain. <laughs> and so let me introduce myself a little bit to those of you who don't know me. My name is Todd Martin. I'm a family medicine doctor here in San Diego, California. I've been in practice for 23 years. And what makes me a little bit different uh, from most doctors is I'm also a professional Argentine tango dancer and performer, which I've been doing for about 25 years. I actually was training in tango at the same time I was doing my residency in San Diego in family medicine and started teaching tango at the same time I started practicing medicine. So the career paths have kind of coincided with one another. But what I have found in medicine is that, you know, so much of the day, you know, 30% of the people that I see are coming in for musculoskeletal pain complaints. That can be low back pain, a lot of foot pain, a lot of ankle pain, particularly a lot of knee pain. And a good percentage of those patients are not old people. They are people in their even in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, you know, you can understand when somebody who's 70 or 80 comes in and they've got arthritis uh, that's causing problems. But there's something else going on when you're seeing a 40 year old coming in with severe arthritis or pain in the ankles and they haven't injured themselves. So somewhere along the line, 15 years ago, I was trying to figure out why we're seeing so many people with this type of pain coming in. And coincidentally, I had issues with the way I walked back then. I, I, I didn't know it, but I had what people said were flat feet. I would wear out the insides of my shoes on a regular basis. I would scuff up the front of my shoes when walking upstairs, and I didn't understand why that was. And then one day when I was walking down the street with, with my wife, who's also my uh, tango partner, um, she 
was holding my hand and then she let it go and told me to stop holding her hand because I wasn't walking right and I was pulling her along and it was hurting her shoulder. And I didn't understand what she was talking about at the time. And I thought maybe I had just kind of lost attention span and I took her hand again and apologized and promised that I would walk correctly. And of course I didn't, I ended up still pulling her hand and her shoulder and she kind of yanked her hand away and told me I needed to learn how to walk right. And that was the wake up call for me. And I think this might've been 12, 13, maybe 14 years ago at this point. And at the time, you know, I was already performing tango in different states and on big stages and stuff. And I'm thinking, you know, what do you mean I can't walk? I mean, tango is a dance about walking. The idea that I can't walk correctly seemed to me rather insulting. And I, I think sometimes when other people are told uh, that they don't walk correctly, they probably have the same attitude that I had when I was first told that I wasn't walking correctly. But what I learned is that very quickly, I wasn't walking correctly, and I began to pay more attention to it and started to apply my dance skills and my understanding of dance technique and apply it to walking. And I immediately realized that I had not been walking correctly. And I just had never thought about it because most people don't think about walking as something that requires technique. We train for hours and hours and hours to dance to do simple movements that are no simpler or more, no more complicated than walking is. But we just don't think about walking because we think it is a natural thing that everybody is supposed to do perfectly well without any training. But if you walk around and you look at people in large groups walking, you'll see so many different types of walks out there. And what I started learning after working on and fixing my own walking technique is that the people coming in to my office for pain issues when they didn't have a trauma related to it often had, and I won't even say often, almost all the time have problems with the way they walk. And so I make a routine practice of taking people out in the hallway and walking them. And almost always there is a direct correlation that is just obvious to between their walking issue and the pain they're complaining of. So particularly like people who come in with duck foot walking or they come in with ankle pain on the insides of their ankle and they're young and they didn't injure themselves. And you're thinking, why would this person be having pain on the insides of both of their ankles with no injury? And so in the old days, say 15 plus years ago, uh, we'd say, well, you know, maybe you've got flat feet. Maybe you're just straining yourself somehow. Let me refer you to the podiatrist and the podiatrist would give them arc supports. But then after I started paying attention to walking technique, what I would do is take these people, stand them up. And almost always they would stand with their feet turned out like with this huge V. And then I walk them out in the hallway and they would walk with their feet turned out with a huge V and generally with a pretty wide based gait. And you're like, oh, okay, well, that's why your ankle's hurting because every time you step, you're rolling your weight over the inside of your ankle. It's pretty obvious. But the problem is there are no other doctors that I work with and I work with in a very large practice. So there's hundreds of doctors in my practice. I've not heard of or seen another doctor examine somebody walking and not even the podiatrist. The podiatrist don't evaluate the way people walk. They look at the feet. Everybody gets examined on the table and they determine, okay, what the issue might be. This tendon must be losing support for whatever reason, not even paying attention to what that reason might be, which is the walking. And okay, let's prop the tendon up. Let's prop the arch up. Let's give it an arch support and then hope that fix it. Let's put you in a boot, let it heal. And a lot of these things don't ultimately develop or cause a chronic long-term sustained fix. And you know, looking at the research with things like plantar fasciitis, there's lots of quick treatments that people can do, cortisone injections, stretches, night splints, things like that. But looking through the research, none of them are long-term effective, which is telling me that they haven't really addressed the cause of the problem. And I'll tell you another situation that I came in 
before that kind of really pointed this out. And this was around the time I started studying walking technique. I went to a orthopedic lecture in Las Vegas and the surgeon was, oh, I think I have a question. And Bill, can you tell me, what, oh, there it is. Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think there's more than one. Can you read them to me? Because I can't, I, it, it disappears really quickly. So I say sometimes I have, um, someone mentioned, sometimes I have a hard time putting my full foot when I walk. Okay, putting the full foot when you walk. And you may need to do a follow-up question to that because I'm gonna try to assume what you are uh, getting at that at there. And so after you've put your full foot down on the ground is the challenge that your weight is on one side of your foot or the other, like your outside or inside of the foot and not the whole foot on the ground? Or is the problem more when you first put the foot or first contact the heel or whatever part of the foot you're contacting on the ground? Is it the initial contact point or after your weight is all on the foot? Is the challenge that your weight is not equally distributed between the feet? Because that is really important and something important for everybody to be aware of. The weight distribution over your foot should be equal between the two, put, this is your foot, the metatarsals on the inside and outside, and then the heel, you should see like a three point triangle here where the weight is evenly distributed between those points and not have the weight all distributed over one part here or one part there on the foot. And that is gonna be all determined by the way you're moving, by the coordination between your abdominal rotation, your upper abdominal rotation, your lower abdominal rotation, which is what controls the rotation of your pelvis and your hip actions. In order to, I think we got. I I, I, yeah. I, 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 okay, yeah. And the, the follow-up was that it only happens when he wears shoes. That is something that's important to understand because shoes, depending on what type of shoes you're wearing, they can alter the way you're walking. And so I think it is a good idea for people to practice walking barefoot and then make sure that their weight is evenly distributed while they're walking barefoot. And if you're, if you're able to walk comfortably barefoot without a heavy heel strike and with good even weight distribution over your feet when you're walking barefoot, then you should be able to apply that with shoes However, if you're wearing shoes that have a significant arch in them, it's going to completely alter the way you walk, and that might cause a challenge. So wearing a more minimalist type of shoe or uh, walking barefoot or just a very flat shoe that doesn't have a significant arch padding on it can help improve the issue if the problem is primarily when you're walking in shoes. And the more you practice it walking barefoot, the more you'll be able to make sure you're using the same technique when you're walking in shoes. Okay, we have another question. So Allah says, hi, Pat. I tried to learn your series of walking clothes, but I find myself nodding and bending forward, and the step is very hard to me. Even when I turn my upper torso, I have a bad landing of the heel. Okay, uh, that's a good question. And uh, let me just backtrack a little bit and talk about the walking code before I answer that question specifically. So the walking code is designed to really understand what inputs are going into our gait or with our walking technique. What exact muscles are we using when we walk? And there has been virtually no study of this. And even the, the biggest classic books on walking technique virtually cover nothing about the core at all. They assume that all walking movement is coming from the legs, whereas it's pretty obvious that we have to use our core to walk, even if we're, when we're turning, it's obvious, but even when we're walking straight forward, it is, should be obvious that we're having to use our abdominal muscles, not just to stabilize our posture, but they are actually what are making us move. Now that 
I believe is absolutely true. The question then is how easy is it for somebody to take, look, listen to the, the discussion of what muscles to move and then take that academic knowledge and apply it to their movement. I, I believe that's challenging, which is why in Tai Chi, which a lot of people um, practice to help with their movement, they don't discuss or even acknowledge um, what the actual movements are. They talk all, all the time about rotation of the core, but there's never any specific discussion of, okay, well, what do you rotate to get this to happen? And I think that's because it is very challenging to take academic knowledge and turn it into functional knowledge. And so I can understand a lot of you might listen to the, my detailed anatomical discussions of the types of rotation used in walking and try and have a hard time applying that. And so I can recognize that that challenge is there. What I would recommend is really trying to use the tips that I'm talking about. If you have un a difficulty understanding the, the detailed summary of what's rotating here and what's rotating there and use the, the points of clarity that we should be using. So the posture should be completely vertical at all times. You should never be thinking of leaning forward. You should make sure that your arms are swinging properly, which is straightforward, left arm with the right leg, right arm with the left leg. Make sure your posture in the pelvis is vertical, so not tilted forward or not tilted back, or when I say vertical, I mean in a neutral position. And then make sure you're not pushing forward. The pushing often is going to be a sign that one of the other issues is not being done correctly, which is going to require us to then push ourselves forward with our glutes, uh, with hip extension, and that's going to cause the heavy impact. So really try to focus on the points. I'd go watch the flow motion video uh, and then try to work on that technique and try to feel the smoothness, work on the softness of the landing. Yes, question. Yes, yeah, so Helen is saying, could the swelling of the foot have anything to do with the way you walk? A uh, swelling of the foot uh, absolutely can and probably in most situations is going to be related to the way you walk unless it's a biochemical issue like gout. So people can get gout, which is an inflammatory condition of one of the joints in the foot or even the ankle due to deposition of a chemical in there, which is a, a sudden acute inflammatory process. But ongoing swelling in a foot um, often it's going to be, particularly the inside of the ankle, which I mentioned before with people who walk duck foot, um, can be related to the way you walk. Because if your weight is on the inside of the foot all the time, so if this is the inside of my foot and the inside of my ankle, as your tibia, sorry, as your uh, lower leg here is going to be supposed to be equally divided over your foot. If the weight is always transferred towards the inside of the foot, what happens is the tendons on the inside of the ankle start to get stretched out, and often they look like they're swollen. Uh, if you've seen the thumbnail for my how to prevent uh, hyperpronation or excessive pronation of the foot video, there's a picture of a foot that has the inside of it swollen a lot. That is from a particular dysfunction of the uh, posterior tibial tendon that starts giving out when the weight is carried too far towards the inside of the foot. And so absolutely it appears like a swollen foot, almost like there's fluid in it, but it's really just because the tendon is stretched out and the soft tissues start to become swollen from progressive and maintained injury. Yeah, question. So we have a gentleman asking, I am a guy walking like a girl and my hip swings like a girl and I want to change that to how should okay, good question. And I think I remember you probably posted a comment on that. And I might actually do a video on that at some point in time. But I think you have pinned or pegged the, the, the reason why it's the hip swiveling that people usually associate with 
girls walking. And I think that's probably from women who walk in heels and who are trying to take very short strides and end up swiveling the hips to move forward rather than moving forward in a, just a continuous flowing fashion. And then some guys will do that uh, also when they walk and it gives the feminine appearance. And I think the big challenge is not to try to walk like a man or walk like a woman. You want to walk effectively in the most natural way that's going to keep your weight distributed well. And if your hips are swiveling, that's probably going to be dis, um, uh, causing an issue with your weight distribution where it's not going to be symmetric. So um, I, a lot of times go to the watch the flow motion video because that's going to core, tell you how to coordinate the upper body with the upper torso with the lower torso rather than trying to over swivel the lower torso because I'm going to stand up for a second the over swiveling of the lower torso people do to compensate for the lack of the upper body rotation and so oh, somebody who thinks they're walking like a girl maybe hip swiveling like that trying to get the body to move forward instead of moving everything equally on my left side and equally on my right side. So there's no swiveling necessary to get the body to go forward versus not really activating this motion and instead trying to compensate with excessive rotation of the lower abdominal rotation. But I will probably do a video on, on that hip swivel walk in the near future that can probably help out. Yeah, question. So this is a follow-up question or question from um, Dr. Saar uh, regarding uh, the, the earlier question that they only have to when they wear shoes. Do you think oversized shoes can cause issues? Absolutely. So there has been a big movement towards trying to promote barefoot running, barefoot walking, or walking in minimalist shoes. Because as I mentioned earlier, when you have a very thick pad on the shoe, for one thing, that prevents people from recognizing when the walking style is incorrect. And one of the most common problems with walking, aside from the duck foot walk, is people leaning forward when they walk. And this is what I used to do and which my wife pointed out to me. I was leaning forward and I thought I was just walking fast and I thought that was a really good thing, but I wasn't walking vertically. And so I had a very heavy heel strike and even nurses would comment that they could always hear when I was coming around the corner. They're like, oh, I knew that was you, Dr. Martin. Uh, cause I could always, now, now they're complaining cause I they seem like I'm sneaking up on everybody cause they can't hear me coming. But Absolutely, that is uh, the issue there. The heel, the shoes prevent you from recognizing you have the problem because they're padding the heel strike. And if you were to walk with bare feet and use the same technique, it would really hurt your heel pretty quickly. And then you would probably compensate and get back to a normal gait pretty quickly. And you probably never would have developed the leaning forward gait to begin with that is allowed because we're wearing the shoes with the heavy cushion on them. So it just allows you to do the wrong thing for long enough that you develop the bad habit. And so that's why minimalist shoes are a really good thing to try out. If you're having issues trying to walk barefoot and practice walking is really important. You just have to be aware that if you're already having pain, then if you try to suddenly go barefoot, that could cause a problem because then you haven't fixed the problem with the heavy heel strike and now you remove the cushion and that can cause a problem. So make gradual changes, go to minimalist shoes, practice walking in minimalist shoes or barefoot for short periods of time and then gradually transition. But absolutely the shoes can cause an issue. And then an elevated heel will also change the way you're able to walk. And so I really recommend no elevated heel in addition to having a more flat foot. Yeah, next question. Sure, so this is from Eric Salinas. This question is, will lots of bicycle riding affect your gait? And if so, how to reverse it? Uh, I don't think so. I think, you know, a lot of people say that, you know, excessive sitting is gonna cause your hip flexors to tighten and affect your gait. Uh, which would be the kind of the same thing as bicycle riding. I really don't think if you are walking correctly in your normal gait style that 
riding a bicycle is going to affect that in a negative way. Now, if you are not walking correctly, then sitting for a long time or riding a bike could cause your hip flexors to tighten up because you're not then going to be stretching them out normally like you would when you are walking with a normal gait. So I do believe that if you're walking with a normal gait, usually whatever tight hip flexors you're going to get from sitting, they're going to stretch themselves out naturally when you start walking, assuming you're walking a significant percentage of the day. If you're stuck in your chair all day long and you never get up to walk, yeah, people can get tight muscles. But if you're going to be walking at least some amount during the day, I don't think that either riding a bicycle or sitting prolonged periods in a chair is going to have a negative effect on that. But you have to make sure you're walking correctly to begin with. And the next question is. So I've got a follow-up question from Montessar. Question is, do you think, do you know of any type of shoes that make walking easier? Uh, yeah, so the minimalist shoes, there's lots of different minimal. I'm not going to promote a particular brand of shoe. A lot of the minimalist shoes are designed for running because a lot of runners are trying to change to mid-strike running and things like that. So you can go to a running store and talk to the uh, salesperson, and I think they can really help you pick out a style of minimalist shoes. They are you know, graded by how flat they are, what sort of uh, rise they have, and the flatter probably the better. Um, I actually like walking around in my vans a lot, which I used for Tai Chi uh, practice, and they're just very flat on the bottom, and they're almost like a, I used them as a mat shoe. Yeah, but I like walking around in those outside all the time also because they don't add anything to the foot. I feel almost like I'm walking barefoot, uh, except I have a cushion that's not going to allow a tack or a glass to cut my foot. And so I think the flatter the shoe, the better. And you can go to a running shoe or just a regular uh, shoe store and somebody can help you out to pick and just say you're looking for a minimalist shoe. There's lots of different brands out there um, that are very good. Next question is. So this is a question for Mo. And what the question is, what do you think about working on ankle mobility and calf flexibility to fit duck feet? Uh, so I did a video uh, called how to fix uh, duck feet with um, or versus external tibial torsion, uh, which is a problem. Exercises, I think, are important. So strengthening the ankles, strengthening the hips, strengthening the knees. I think you can always work on strengthening and stretching the muscles. However, I think duck feet primarily for most people is going to be a consequence of the way you're walking and not the lack of muscle strength. So one of my favorite uh, quotations is from the uh, architect uh, Lewis Sullivan. Uh, form ever follows function, which we mostly learn as form follows function. I believe the function is the primary thing. How you move is going to determine your form, which is going to be what your joints and soft tissue structures look like. So if your feet are turning out, it's likely that they're turning out as a consequence of how you're moving your body it's not the other way around. It's not that your feet started turning out and that's why you're moving this way. It starts with the way you walk. So if you begin walking with the correct technique, then you're going to start to have your feet move into the right position. I don't believe that just strengthening your legs or your ankles is going to cause your feet to turn back inwards. And you can see this in a lot of very strong people. I see bodybuilders walking down the street with duck feet all the time because they're not using the correct motion. And they have calves that are like bulging out like somebody's thigh. And so I understand that this is not a strength issue. This is a problem with the way you're functioning. So you have to work on the proper core movements if you feel you have weakness, it's always fine to do exercises to strengthen muscles, but I am a strong believer that doing the right movements will strengthen the right muscles. It's why when you have athletes that are 
in different types of sports and they develop different types of bodies. Gymnasts have different body types than swimmers, have different body types than runners because the function that they're doing actually shapes their body in a very specific way. And I think it's gonna be the same thing for a walking technique. If you walk in the correct fashion that causes your feet to face straight forward, your feet will straight face straight forward. If you walk in a fashion that causes your feet to turn out, your feet will turn out. And the longer you do that, the more the connective tissues will tighten up and then start to keep your feet out in that way so it becomes more difficult to straighten them out. And I'm, oh, another question. I was gonna get up and do a demonstration, but I'll take the question first. Okay, let me do the demonstration. So I can walk with my feet facing straight forward, and that's because of the way I'm using the core. But if I change a little motion in the core, like engaging my lower abs before the upper abs, it makes me walk like this. And so my feet turn out, not because I, my hips or my lower legs suddenly got weak. I just changed the pattern of movement here and it turns the feet out. And then there's other patterns of movement in the core that'll make your feet turn out even more. And then over time, what happens is because the feet are this way and the lower leg is having this traction out in this direction relative to your knee all the time, eventually, it's going to start to form out that way, and then you can start having trouble getting your feet back in a straightforward position. I recommend you know, practicing the couple exercises videos that I've done, like the core balance and stability routine, and then another uh, new one that I put out there for correcting duck feet that has you practice you know, turning your feet in and out like that, walking around in a circle, like this, starting there. And this really helps with to mobilize the feet so and the legs. So if you do have an issue with being able to turn your feet back into this position, if you're practicing these movements and you can do that and stand there comfortably, then the problem is not probably with your strength or flexibility, it's with the pattern of movement. But if you have difficulty turning your feet in, then you probably do need to work on stretches for your hips so they can turn in this way like that and work on that as well as the strengthening, but you must have the right pattern of movement in order to fix the duck feet walk ultimately. And uh, let me go back quickly to a story I was about to tell that pointed me towards what I'm doing right now. And this was uh, back probably 15 years ago after I was starting to work on my walking technique. And I went to that Le Vegas lecture on patellofemoral syndrome. Patellofemoral syndrome, and a lot of you might have it, is pain in the front of the knee, under the kneecap that people get. And it often occurs in young people before there's even any possibility that they've developed arthritis. And it occurs a lot with just walking, occurs, also, occurs often with running. And it's this front of the knee pain that happens. And it was very, it's very difficult to fix and the classic teaching on this was that it was due to weak muscles. And so the weak muscles caused the patella to be unstable and move asymmetrically as people are walking and that friction causes pain. And the orthopedic doctor was saying that he was always frustrated with this theory of uh, the cause of patellofemoral syndrome because he get bodybuilders coming in and as he was trying to do the lecture on how you have to strengthen your vastus medialis muscle, he, the, the guy would have a big the muscle would be bulging out of his leg like a grapefruit and he'd be telling him how he has to strengthen that muscle because that's the, the known cause of patellofemoral syndrome. And then they had to kind of morph their idea to, uh, well, maybe it's not just weakness. Maybe the problem is that the muscles are too tight or weak. So then the teaching became well, we got to strengthen and stretch the muscles. And then that's now the recognized therapy for patellofemoral syndrome. But I am almost certain that nobody took this, any of these people out in the hallway and found out that they were walking like this. And that's actually what's causing the stress on the patella as the weight's changing. And so it just became very clear to me that 
most doctors and even the head top doctors who are doing research on all these things are just missing the boat entirely because they're not checking the way people are functioning and they're thinking that everything is due to either a muscle weakness or a muscle tightness or some genetic defect in the way the patella alignment is. Whereas I think these things could probably much more simply be explained by a functional issue because people just are not walking correctly and most doctors don't even realize that that is a thing out there. And so of course they don't instruct patients on that. And so the problems never get fixed. And so patellofemoral syndrome, plantar fasciitis is another one of these things. These are functional problems that people develop because of the way they're moving. And almost all doctors are going to look at you on the table and try to determine what's going on from looking at you in a static position. And so they're kind of missing the boat. Okay, question. So this is from Eric Salinas. What typically causes a I always step first with my right leg, and it seems to cover more ground compared to my left. Okay, good question. I'm going to stand right back up for that. So the leading leg, and uh, I'll just, you could mean different things by that. The leading leg could be the leg that's actually causing the body to move. So in this term, my in this sense, my standing leg, which is my right leg right here, is moving the body forward. Or you could say my swing leg is leading leg because it's in front of the body. So I'll address both of those situations here. When we are standing, it appears that my core is just flat. But everything, including standing, is a combination of rotations. So when I change my weight to my left leg here, I'm going to be rotating my upper torso forward on the left, and I'm rotating my lower torso backward on the left, and that results, and I'm actually flexing my left hip, this results in this standing position. It looks like I'm equally weighted, but I've got all my core energy on the left. I'm rotating here with the upper torso, rotating here with the lower torso, and I have this hip flexed. This leads my weight to be on my left leg, even though visually it appears that it's equal weighted. Now, if I was gonna try to walk in this position, from this position, I can't actually step off on this leg and lead with my right leg out because my weight's already situated on the left leg. There's not enough movement happening to get that to happen. If I am already in the movement that would occur when I do the leg swing, all of the muscles are already engaged doing that motion. Now, if I want to step off, I'm gonna to have to change my weight to my right leg and then I can step off. It's very difficult unless you're really aware of the sort of things I'm talking about to understand which leg you are already rooted on because whatever leg you're rooted on, if I'm rooted on my right leg, sorry, my left leg, I'm gonna to have to change to the right leg to step off. I can't start rooted on the left leg and then step off like that. I have to change first. So if you're, there's an asymmetry, uh, meaning you have either difficulty stepping off with one foot or the other, that's not unusual. Most of us have a natural way to stand. And sometimes we'll shift weight from one leg to the other. And these are all, more obvious ways of changing the core movement. But even when we're standing still, we are on one leg or the other, and most people probably have a tendency to be rooted on the same leg usually, and so they're often gonna step off the same way. Some people might stand rooted on their left leg all the time, which means when they step off, they're gonna step with their left leg because first they have to transfer the weight to the right leg and step off. And they don't normally step off with the right leg because they've already had their weight rooted over here. And this is a very subconscious body habit thing that people are going to do. And if you wanna to try to be able to step off equally with either lead leg, you'll have to practice understanding where your weight is situated. I can, I can take my weight from my left leg and now I'm gonna change it to my right even though you probably couldn't really see that. I have my weight on my right leg, now I have my weight on my left leg. Now I have my weight on my right leg and so now that my weight is on my right leg, I can step off easily with my 
right leg because I'm able to consciously switch uh, which orientation my core is in. So that just takes a little bit more conscious awareness, but it's not unusual to have one side or the other as your usual side that you're weighted on, and that's going to determine which leg you step off on. Okay, next, next question. question. Okay, this is from Amanda. I want my legs slightly pointed sideways. I find it weird to walk with my legs pointed directly forward. I don't know if that's considered right or wrong. I think right or wrong, I don't like to call things right or wrong, but you have to think of things whether they're healthy or unhealthy. So the joints in the legs are designed to move straight forward. So your knees need to be lined up forward with your, I as well stay standing for some of these because I got to demonstrate. Your knees should be lined up over your ankles when we move. So that's how they're designed to move. And when we place our foot it's designed to have the knee roll straight forward over the ankle and then continue to step. If we step with our feet turned out like this, which is an incredibly common thing to do, what happens when we're changing weight is all the weight is going over the inside of the knee instead of equally over both sides of the knee. And what happens is the ligaments and tendons that are holding the structure of the inside of your knee together are gonna to be stretched and stressed as you do that. The inside of the ankle is going to get stressed and this is what causes the arches to collapse and people to get that swollen ankle feeling because those the force of that impact 10,000 times a day is going to be stretching out those tendons and causing pain. So if your knees are pointed out this way when you're walking, you've probably been doing that for many, many years and it can be difficult to change the body habit. It would be helpful if you can, over time, start to develop the pattern of movement that's going to get your feet to come back in line so you're not causing the excessive stress. How easy that is, I can't really say. It, if you've been doing something for 10 years, changing that pattern of movement um, can be a challenge. I would just say that it's worth trying to do that because absolutely over time, there is going to be damage done by having your feet turned out in this direction. Over time, I probably am going to have in-person walking classes uh, here or in different uh, venues and stuff. And I think it would be helpful to be able to do things live with somebody because it is a challenge to learn things online and try to have somebody help you change a way of moving. And we don't normally try to teach dance through video. We try to do it live where we can really work with somebody's body. Uh, but since Obviously, the pandemic came on and all these things has been very hard to set up that sort of thing. I do hope in the near future, now that things, at least in the United States, are calming down, uh, plan to start doing some live classes so I can really help people one on one or, or in a group setting, but live uh, to really help them work on these sort of things, because it is a very valuable thing to try to fix. Is there another question? Is that... OK, uh, so let me sit back down then. Oh, yes, absolutely. I really appreciate all the questions that you've been asking. Uh, these are super great. Uh, this is my first live stream. So uh, at one minute, two, there were zero people waiting. And I was like, oh, this may not, I just might be talking to my wife here. Uh, so I'm really glad that people have come on and asked some really important questions. And I am absolutely dedicated to providing the best information I can to help you fix your walk if you're having issues with the way you walk, or if you just feel uncomfortable with the way you walk and you wanna feel more comfortable with the way you walk, I'm gonna provide as much information as I can. And you can always send a comment to me. I will do my best, and I think you probably already know that I answer all my comments. If somebody has a specific question, I try to do my best to uh, answer those questions. I do think going forward, uh, doing the YouTube live stream. So this is the first one. This is going to be a good way to try to get your feedback directly and maybe even bounce back and forth with the question rather than just having the one 
uh, comment to post back to. So this could be a very valuable way to do it. And I do think down the road, doing these live in some sort of setting, uh, even if this became more successful, even traveling to different places so I could do this and offer live instruction to the most people possible would be an absolute great thing to do. I saw a hand up with that. Was it? Well, I just wanted to share that I think that perhaps doing a live Zoom um, gathering can be very helpful. Oh, that's a good point. That's just something I was actually planning on. And thank you, Bell, for uh, reminding me that uh, one of the things that you can do or that I can do with you uh, short of actually a live session where you have to travel somewhere or I, where I have to travel somewhere is doing a live Zoom session. And that may be something that I set up initially that would be uh, for my members uh, because we have to, have, you know, we get there's you're supposed to have some sort of uh, teaser, some th sort of sort of attraction for people to join your membership. And normally, I, you know, I really like giving out things for free. I don't like asking for money for things, but uh, starting to do an actual live virtual training where you can be on video, I can be on video, I can watch you walk and things like that would be a helpful thing short of people coming in to see me. But I would probably initially do that for members so they feel like they're having some benefit. Uh, like James has been out there supporting me from the very beginning when I, James Smith, uh, put out memberships and uh, that support is super valuable to me uh, to show that uh, what I'm offering is valuable to you. And so I would probably start off doing some live Zoom sessions for my uh, members only to start with, uh, where they can actually do video consultation with me. I can actually watch them do what they're doing and we can go direct back and forth rather than just sending me a video. Yeah, next question. So this is Uh, yeah, so the calf muscle is going to plantar flex your ankle, and that means pushing down uh, with your ankle. And I'm going to tell you the specific action that the calf muscle is going to be doing when we walk, but I would caution people to try not to overthink what the leg muscles are doing when you walk, because we don't direct our body when we're walking using the lower leg. So if we were walking down the street and we had to think about when to plant our flex versus dorsiflex the ankle or extend versus flex the knee, we wouldn't get very far. The core is what directs or guides the movement and then the lower leg movements are gonna be reflexive. So I'm gonna absolutely explain what the calf muscles are doing, uh, but I don't want you to overthink that when you're trying to walk. That's when people start to think, oh, I gotta push down on my ankle at this point. And if you try to do that consciously, you're never gonna coordinate it well enough because the our balance is such a delicate thing when we walk or when we're standing. If you think about it this way, if my ankle, plantar flexes like this, everything has to coordinate in the whole body to make that make allow me to stand up while it's doing that. If I was standing this way and I just plantar flexed my ankle even five degrees, I would fall over backward. So our body doesn't really allow us to individually activate these lower extremity muscles while we're standing up because our natural reflexes prevent us from doing a prat fall on the ground uh, unless we're really determined to do that then i can block out my reflexes and i can just fall over backwards but normally my body is going to counterbalance if i try to do that and it's going to engage all my muscles automatically to prevent my, myself from falling over otherwise we'd be falling down left and right but specifically when we are engaging the calf muscles. So this is when we're gonna be plantar flexing the ankle. And there's a per, some particular moments in time where we're going to actively plantar flex the ankle. The first time is gonna be as we are, after we've placed the lead foot down on the heel and I'm changing my weight, the calf muscles are gonna plantar flex the ankle between this position and this position. 
And that is going to put the foot down relatively quickly, and it's going to help to decelerate the movement of the body. Whereas if my foot was ankle, uh, dorsiflexed up here and I changed weight, what would happen is I would start to pitch forward. So the ankle plantar flexing as we do the loading response phase stops the body from progressing forward until I engage the lift phase of the step. So that's going to be the first active place where the ankle or is plantar flexing, and then that is that is the calf muscle that's creating that plantar flexing movement. Once we do that, and now we're going to swing through, now the ankle is going to be dorsiflexing on my left side. So this ankle is going to be doing the opposite of plantar flexing. So I'm actually using the muscles in the front of my ankle as I do the swing through. And then the next part where we're going to engage the calf muscle is during the terminal swing portion of the step, which is after I do the swing through and between the mid swing portion and when the foot or heel comes and contacts the ground, that's going to be the next part where you're getting active calf action or ankle plantar flexion. That's going to be between the mid swing portion and heel strike. I'm going to balance myself on the door here. Uh, so heel contact here on my right foot is going to happen between here and now here. That's when my, my ankle is actively plantar flexing up until the point where the heel comes down. That's my left ankle or the back ankle here is actively plantar flexing using my calf muscles. So it's actively calf contraction there. Now I have the calf contraction on the right side as I lower and my calf becomes passive on the left as I lower the forefoot to the ground. Hope that answers the question, James. Yeah, next question. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I did say that you shouldn't be focused on the muscles. Like, don't try to think about plantar flexing or dorsiflexing your ankles. Those are going to occur naturally. But the natural way people walk is heel first. It's naturally place, roll, place, roll, place, roll. Studies have shown that historically speaking, throughout the ages of humanity, uh, people have naturally walked heel first. The heel is the strongest and largest bone in the foot, primarily for that reason. It's designed to be the place where the impact happens. There's no sensitive soft tissue or nerves in the heel. So if you step on something hard or sharp, you might cut the skin and or the or the fat in there, but you're not gonna cause any serious damage. Whereas you could step on the forefoot on a piece of glass and slice the nerves that go to your toes and cause a serious problem. There's a fat pad underneath your heel uh, between the bone and the skin that's designed for landing. It's a natural cushion on the heel. So yeah, absolutely, we should focus on placing on the heel. And I believe 99% of people do naturally place on the heel place and then we roll and place and roll. And that rolling action is what makes walking gait so efficient. You can walk on your, on your toes, like I can place with my toes like this and walk around. And in tango, we actually do place with the ball of the foot and roll like that. And it's very elegant, but it's not an efficient way to move. It's not fast if I'm trying to travel somewhere. The efficient way to move is to let the body use the natural gravity, and I don't mean gravity by falling forward, I mean gravity to help you glide forward, it makes the walking more efficient. If I'm using a tip to walk, then I'm having to use my muscles for every part of the action and not letting natural gravity create efficiencies there. So there's all kinds of reasons for placing on the heel and absolutely it is absolutely a must to focus on placing on your heel. So Claire May on Selena says, can we talk a bit about anterior or posterior pelvic tilt affecting the gait function? Uh, absolutely. So anterior pelvic tilt is going to be when your pelvis, here's your pelvic bone here, 
If your pelvis is tilted forward, that's anterior pelvic tilt. And so that's like if you're going to tip the bowl forward and pour the water out the front of the bowl, that's an anterior pelvic tilt. And this often causes a, well, it does cause a, an extreme exaggerated lordosis or lumbar arch. And you'll see a lot of women stand this way in particularly where the arch, the butt appears to be sticking back and it causes a lot of strain in there. But when people walk with an anterior pelvic tilt, they get used to that. So the muscles actually get fixed in that position and the natural posture becomes fixed in that position. And I see so many people who have lower back pain and then I stand them up and they've got this huge curvature there because of the way they're standing and the way they're standing is correlated with the way they're walking. So anterior pelvic tilt, I believe, is absolutely related not just to posture, but to the way people walk. And what happens is this. When people are walking, I've talked a lot about people who push off. When you push off using your glutes, and a lot of people you'll see on YouTube say, yeah, push with your glutes. You're not supposed to push with your glutes when you walk. If you do this, you push with your glutes, that is what's going to happen. My First thing that's gonna happen is I'm gonna pitch forward as I'm walking, and then you're gonna get a very hard heel strike. And sometimes you'll see people who can't compensate for that, particularly older people, and you'll see them walking, leaning forward like that. And that's very obvious. But what's not as obvious is when people compensate for that by extending their upper back muscles. And instead of walking like that, by pushing, they just compensate by extending my upper back muscles. So now it looks like they have okay posture, but they're now walking with an anterior pelvic tilt because they're really in a lean as far as their pelvis is concerned, but they're just pulling the upper back up. And so now the pelvis is still tilted forward. And I think that's a big cause of anterior pelvic tilt. Almost all people that I've seen that are walking with anterior pelvic tilt are pushing off with their glutes instead of lifting, lifting forward. I'm lifting myself forward like this, not pushing myself forward like that. And so that's going to be the anterior pelvic tilt. Posterior pelvic tilt is going to be when you're tilting your pelvis like that. That's like uh, if you saw the movie Sling Blade, where he walks like this. Like, wish I had some French fried potatoes. That's my sling blade impression. Sorry, my wife's like saying, why did you do that? <laughs> uh, so that's the sling blade walk. So you get the shoulders rolled forward and you got the pelvis rolled back like this. And you get a very small stride. So very short strides there. And so that's gonna be associated with not engaging your lower abdominal and upper abdominal muscles correctly. Often people are gonna have over engagement of the lower abdominal muscles. And I, what I mean by that is normally when I'm switching weight, I either have my right lower abdominals engaged to have my weight on the right leg or my left lower abdominal muscles engaged to have the weight on the left leg. And I can switch back and forth but I don't engage them both at the same time because not only do they lower abdominals rotate the spine towards the leg that you're standing on, they also are tucking the pelvis under at the same time. So when I'm engaged on my right leg only, I've got a tuck and rotation of the lower abs on the right, which keeps my weight here balanced. But if I have both legs down and I tuck both at the same time, now you've got an over tuck, you've got the double tuck, and that's the posterior pelvic tilt that people are gonna have. And often what's gonna happen is you're never really changing weight from one leg to the other as you walk. You're really walking split weight the whole time. And so not only does it affect your back posture, but your weight, your spine is always right down the middle of the two feet, and then it never really switches to align your weight over the standing leg. And so essentially you're walking like this, and even though it's a low impact walk, all of your weight is down, right down the middle of your legs and is gonna be straining the knees and the ankles, even though it doesn't appear uh, so dramatic because you're not like falling forward and plopping, but your weight distribution is not gonna be equal over the two feet. So that's how I see posterior pelvic tilt and anterior pelvic tilt. Great question. question 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so walking with flat feet is a really common problem, and I believe it's associated primarily with a number of things, including the pushing off with the walk. So when you're pushing off, you're going to be hitting hard. When I use my glutes and I push, I hit the heel hard, and then I also land immediately on the flat foot before I have engaged the lower abs to transfer the weight. When we walk correctly, what's happening is we place the heel and then I engage my lower abs and that shifts my weight forward. And by the time I've finished bringing my foot to the flat position, I've transferred my spine over that leg by using the lower abdominal rotation. And I've tucked the pelvis so I'm vertical. And now all my weight's gonna be lined up over the foot directly by the time the weight is transferred off my rear leg. So that is gonna be normal walking gait. It's gonna prevent flat feet and it's gonna prevent pain in the legs because the pain is gonna be caused by two different things. When I push off, number one, I'm gonna hit hard and that's gonna cause pain. And as I keep pushing, I'm landing my flat foot, therefore all my weight on that leg before I've transferred the weight towards the full foot because I have not yet engaged my lower abs on the left yet. I've pushed off, I've landed, and you can see my knee, I'll exaggerate this so you can see it, my knee is really oriented that way. And so the weight's over the arch of the foot, which is gonna flatten it out, and it's gonna cause pain because I hit the heel hard, and now I have the weight on the inside of the foot instead of here. So that's why it's so important to lift from your front of your hips, from the end of the loading response phase, lift from here, that's lifting. You can try to float like that. So I'm walking around, I'm lifting myself forward. You can see I can do that very slowly. Once I do this, and use my glute as soon as I do that. Now you have a hard hit and no good weight change. And it may be a faster way to walk, but you're going to have your joints misaligned and you're going to end up with pain. So lift forward. Don't push forward. And I think you're going to have a better time with your heel placement. A lot of people, if people feel comfortable walking with their duck feet because it prevents them from pushing. So they end up not pushing, so they don't have as much heel pain, but then they're gonna get all this problem here with pain that's gonna result later down the road. Okay, next question. Eric Sonnen, can you forward or reverse lunge exercises help with better walking? I, I would, exercises to strengthen your body are a great thing. I don't think that they necessarily help with walking because you don't need a lot of strength to walk. Uh, and when we walk normally, if you can stand up, then you can walk. And then we're cooperating with gravity in order to walk in a smooth fashion. You don't need, need a lot of extra strength in order to walk correctly unless you're trying to power walk or, uh, you know, you're in the Olympics for race walking and you're trying to beat the speed of everybody. Uh, so lunges can help with strength, but and they're very helpful for strength, lunges and squats, but you can easily injure yourself if you don't perform them correctly. And a lot of people don't, for the same reason I talked about with the whole pushing off and the weights over the inside of the foot. And if you lunge that way, then you're gonna be really straining the inside. You have to really engage the lower abs when you're lunging correctly so they're keeping your weight knee aligned properly and so the right body movement is going to keep your leg there versus there if you're pushing off incorrectly then you're going to strain yourself so i'm all for lunges and squats as an exercise but you have to make make sure you're doing them correctly because those are the uh, exercises that are very prone to causing injury if they're done incorrectly so do them with a trainer if you're originally starting uh, to do that sort of exercise and you're not uh, well versed in it so you don't hurt yourself. So Next question. Uh, 
Uh, so that's what I was just talking about there. The tipping forward is going to be almost always associated with trying to push the body forward. So there are a couple, of, there's a lot of different ways you can walk. But from this point, when we are walking, this is the loading response phase. So I have landed with my four, full forefoot on the ground. My center of gravity is still between the two legs. This is where I am going to lift forward with my hip flexion. I'm going to lift from the front of the legs. My psoas muscle and the hip flexors are going to pull. What essentially they're doing is pulling the hip forward like that. So that's flexing this forward hip. At the same time, the lower abs are tucking the pelvis, and that results in combination with a forward movement. So that is engaging the right process of the hip muscles to move forward. But what happens if you try to push forward is if your, your center of gravity is behind your foot. So if you try to push with your hip, what's going to happen is you're going to push yourself back. You can't push yourself forward unless your center of gravity is in front of your foot. And then if you push yourself forward, what's going to happen is you're going to lean with that. And so the leaning forward, the tipping forward, is always going to be associated with trying to use your glutes to push the body forward instead of using your hip muscles in the front of your hip to lift the body forward. So work on that. If you find yourself tipping forward, it's because you're pushing off, not lifting up. Uh, so, excellent question. I'm glad you asked that because I, I do need to clarify because there's different gates that we use depending on where we're walking or what sort of ground we're walking on. So when we're walking on flat ground, absolutely do not push yourself forward ever. Um, the time some people do, there is a one way to push yourself forward that power walkers sometimes do, which I also disagree with because I think it causes a very hot, heavy heel strike. If you from this position, combine pushing with your glutes on this leg and lifting with your hip flexors on this leg, you can get that sort of walk, this really long stride sort of walk. Um, there's uh, one guy who does a walk, how to walk faster, how to power walk video you see on YouTube, and he has this huge long stride. That's using your glutes and opposite hip flexors at the same time, but you're really coming down hard on the heel, so I do not recommend that. And the, other, the time where it is appropriate to use your hip extensors, meaning push when you're walking, is when you're walking uphill. So if you're walking uphill, and I don't have a hill in front of me, but I'll just try to uh, just imagine I'm walking uphill. When I'm walking down flat ground, I don't need any energy on my back leg to shift the body forward. I'm using all the energy on my standing leg side to pull the body weight forward. I don't have to push off. I'm using my lower abs here to pull forward. If you're gonna be walking uphill, there's not enough energy on this side to pull yourself forward going up a hill. So there, during the loading response phase of the step, which is when you're bringing your flat foot down, your foot down to the flat position on a hill, there's going to be a push to this point where you have to use your glutes on your back leg to push yourself up the hill until your foot gets the flat position. Then you're going to lift yourself up using the hip flexors here, and then you're going to push yourself forward at the end of the step, and then you're going to tuck. So now I'm extending my glutes here on the left to get up the hill. Then I'm lifting up and then pushing. Uh, watch my how to walk uphill video for the clarification on that. And I think that will uh, really help understand that one position where you're going to use your glutes to get yourself uphill. And I think we are out of time. Is that right? So thank you all for joining me for this session. Grab my chair back. Uh, you have really made this a super success. And I'm so happy 
uh, that you all uh, came and engaged with so many great questions. Please, if you have other questions, just leave them in the comments. If I wasn't clear, if there's some good questions that are um, from a lot of different people and I don't feel I have answered them in previous videos, I might actually shoot another video to help answer some questions in more detail. I have probably a hundred or more walking technique videos already up. So I, I have covered so many different topics. Uh, I might be able to just point you to a video you haven't seen yet or point you to more focus on a particular video so you can get an answer to your question there. But I am always willing to make other videos uh, to help out uh, if the question hasn't been answered in another way on a previous video. Thank you so much, everybody. And I hope you'll join me. I'll probably be doing these on a monthly basis since this was so successful. And I'm probably gonna set up a Zoom training for those of you who are members for a live interactive where I can actually see you and you can demonstrate for me what challenges you might have to have. And we can do that almost like a dance lesson sort of thing, which is so important for walking and uh, it's gonna be really helpful for you. So if you're not a member already, please join up as a member. Uh, it's very low cost, but it shows your support for the channel and the work that I do. And also I'm gonna reward that work by having those direct sessions with you where I can actually see you and answer questions uh, in that manner. So I hope to see you there. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a great day, bye.